So thanks all everybody. Right. Uh, yes, you, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right, uh, let's go. Uh, hello everyone, welcome to the first DRCC seminar of the second semester of the year. Um, today we have Johannes Hearns, uh, who's gonna tell us about light uh, thermal dark matter enabled by a second Higgs. Uh, Johannes got his PhD from the Technical University of Munich and now he holds a postdoctoral position at the prestigious Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg. Uh, for students, um, uh, the attendance list will appear in the chat shortly. Uh, a list of your presents of my president of Shash, Mekio Poko. Uh, so Johannes, uh, whenever you're ready, please take it away. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the invitation and organization, Yago. And, uh... I'm, I'm happy to be here uh, to pre present this work and introduce you to light thermal dark matter. Um, this is based in a good part on work that I did with my colleagues uh, Zulip Jana in uh, Max Park in Heidelberg and uh, Shaikh Saad in Basel and Vishnu um, in Oklahoma State. Yeah, so and because I heard that not all of you are personally working on dark matter alone, um, I, I thought that I would um, start out very introductory with. Uh, or all of the all of the context why we're interested in this, and then focus on, on thermal relic dark matter, and finally come to this uh, particular work on, on light thermal dark matter with a second Higgs. Yeah, so I'm I'm sure you all heard about <laughs> dark matter. Um, in in very brief, this talk will be first about the fact that there appears to be a lot of dark matter in the universe. Then I will try to convince you that MEV scale thermal relics are, are possible and very promising to look for in the near future. Um, and, and finally, that a um, uh, light scaler from a second Higgs doublet can play a vital role in enabling these uh, light thermal dark matter candidates. So, uh, yeah, <clears throat> what is this dark matter? First, go through the evidence. Uh, you've seen this uh, many times. Maybe I add some, some, some points which you haven't seen before, hopefully. Um, there's evidence for dark matter from all kinds of scales. Well, not all kinds of scales, but really only from, from a thousand light years up. Um, so uh, the smaller scales where you're really sure that there's a lot of dark matter is observable at kiloparsec scales. Um, so uh, galaxies, right? Uh, galactic rotation curves being the, the most prom prominent one, um, where you see that if you look at the, the rotation of this galactic disk here around its center, if you look at this uh, rotation speed and measure that out far beyond the visible disk. So this is actually, a, it's a Hubble Space Telescope image of this galaxy to scale. So we're looking at, at hydrogen clouds rotating around this galaxy much further out than where you can see it in visible light. Um, and you see that the rotation speed stays, flattens, and then stays constant far out be, beyond where you expect all of the visible matter. So you expect the, the visible disk matter to be concentrated uh, well around the center where you see it, but the rotation speed stays constant all the way out, which needs additional, con well, from which you can infer that there's a lot more mass that holds this galaxy together um, in a very diffuse halo around this galaxy which extends far beyond the disk. And that would be this uh, dot dash dark matter component here. And from this, you can, well, basically, this is one particular galaxy. You can also look at our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So this is a rotation curve of the Milky Way. We live somewhere around here is the sun. You see that the rotation curve here is dominated by, by the visible stuff, like, or, like the sun and other stars. Um, but further out, also dark matter then dominates. And from these observations, you learn something about dark matter, right? The most obvious thing is that whatever it is, it is kind of long-lived, right? It's still here, it hasn't gone away. It's here in our own galaxy. You also know that it's dissipationless, right? It doesn't, or reasonably dissipationless, it, it doesn't cluster like the baryons to the center, but it kind of stays out. And you also learn that it's not completely relativistic so that it's able to, to, to well, fall into these halos a bit. Then going to larger scales, um, you can look at galaxy clusters. And people looking at galaxy clusters discovered a long time ago, almost 100 years ago, that something's off there. Then, uh, famously, it, uh, Frank Zwicky looked at, uh, Frank Zwicky looked at the uh, Koma, Nebelhaufen, sorry, this is uh, his papers in German. Um, and he observes that the, the velocities of the galaxies in the cluster, they 
have relative velocities of thousands of kilometers per second from the Doppler broadening, right? Some of the galaxies go towards you, some go backwards. So from the Doppler broadening, you can infer their relative velocities. And you can relate this to the potential energy by the Virial theorem, which tells you that the kinetic energy is related to the total potential energy. So from this, you now can infer how much potential energy, how much mass is there in the cluster. And well, <clears throat> Then he compares that to, okay, what, what are the velocities you would expect just from the visible matter, just from the, the light from the galaxies there. And he says that, okay, looking just at the stars and galaxies, you would expect 80 kilometers per second. But what you see is 2000 kilometers per second. So there, clearly there's something off. Well, now we know that also he wasn't taking into account all of the cluster gas, but still there, this, this uh, discrepancy remains, which is evidence for dark matter. You can also probe masses at galaxy cluster scales through weak gravitational lensing. So this is um, this is a picture, uh, just a picture um, of um, of a, two galaxy clusters. So these these dots here are galaxies, and then there's there's a lot of background galaxies which are maybe kind of flattened and deformed a bit. And from the background galaxies, which are um, lensed by the gravitational pull of the foreground cluster and get deformed a bit, you can infer the masses present in these foreground clusters. And that's what these green contours are about. So this is another way to measure mass of galaxy clusters. And now you can say, okay, well, does this mass that we measure work out compared to the mass the, that we expect from, from visible matter? And the answer is no. And the most, um, and well, the more thrilling example of this is this uh, bullet cluster here. So this is the, the same, same galaxy cluster, right? Same green contours, but now we're looking at it in X-rays. So what you see is not no more the, the galaxies here, but what you see instead is the hot X-ray gas. Actually, the gravitational potential in these clusters is so strong that the, um, the gas in the clusters is heated to about 10 kV. So you see it in X-rays and the temperature is a probe of the gravitational potential just by hydrodynamics of the gas, or just by the plasma dynamics of the gas. So you, from the X-ray Im image, you can also infer masses. And looking at any uh, normal cluster, you would also see like, a, like an X-ray blob here. And from that, if it's just nice and sitting there, the cluster, you could infer the gravitational potential from the X-rays alone. Now, this is a special example because it turns out that the, this is um, these are interacting clusters. They're not just, they're sitting by themselves, but actually the small bullet cluster passed through the bigger host cluster, like a bullet. I, I don't know which, which way my screen is flipped on your screen, but uh, so the, the point is the smaller one went like a bullet through the bigger one. Um, yeah, and was shock heated and so on. But the important point here is that most of the cluster mass where most of the baryonic mass, most of the known matter in clusters is in the inter intracluster gas. So you would expect that all of the gravity should be centered on these glowing things here, on the gas, because that's where most of the mass is in baryons. But from the lensing evidence, we see that actually the mass centroid remains centered on the position of the galaxies, not on the gas. So this is again evidence that these galaxy clusters inhabit very large dark matter halos and that in this interaction the halos of the two clusters just passed through each other and did not get stuck like the gas did right the, the gas here got a bit stuck this is evidence for dark matter on galaxy cluster scales and from it we can learn that dark matter needs to be kind of collisionless right otherwise it would have gotten stuck like the gas did here finally you can go to the largest scales that we can observe in cosmology looking at, for example, at, at the CMB. And there you can, you can try to model the temperature fluctuations of this cosmic microwave background. Um, so, so this is more or less the picture you see in the sky. And if you go into the frequency domain, then you see this and you have these oscillations here, these baryonic oscillations, um, which are an interplay of all of the stuff present in the early universe of the dark matter and the baryons, and then also a bit of dark energy. Um, so, being able to fit this really well, you can determine the parameters in your cosmological model. And in, in this Lambda CDM, so, so Lambda dark energy, CDM cold dark matter, in this dark energy, dark matter, standard model of cosmology, you can then 
determine the, the cosmological average density of dark matter to very nice precision. So this is the most precise measurement of the average density of dark matter that we have. And here dark matter is, is clearly necessary to reproduce the pattern that we see here in, in the top. Next thing that you can look at at large scales is, um, okay, so uh, let's, let's see, can we reproduce the structures that we observe in, in the universe? So galaxies and clusters and how they correlate um, using dark matter. Um, here in this picture, you see that, well, uh, the blue stuff is observation from, from galaxy surveys, and the red stuff is a dark matter simulation. Um, it's basically, it's spatial positions of galaxies in the sky. Um, you see that the patterns in these, you couldn't tell them apart, whether it's, well, if, if I recolored them, who would know, right? Um, so meaning to say that actually this cold dark matter leads to a pretty good understanding of structure formation. It matches really well the observation. Now, a final piece of evidence for dark matter, which is not really a piece of evidence for dark matter, but really just... Um, puts the context straight, is in Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So um, until here, you could have said, well, okay, I mean, there's, there's lots of matter, which doesn't really work like the baryons do, right? So for example, here it was the, it, it doesn't cluster like the baryons, but maybe it's just, uh, well, lone planets, right? Lone planets, for example, they are, they're dark, they don't shine themselves very much, right? Um, they would be very rare, they wouldn't collide very often. So they would, in principle, be a dark matter candidate, right? just non-luminous matter out there. But from Big Bang nucleosynthesis, so from, from how uh, protons and neutrons in the early universe formed the first atoms, well, the first, sorry, the first nuclei of uh, deuterium and helium, from that, we know how many baryons there were in the early universe and that none of these got reprocessed into all of the dark matter. So what you can see here is the predictions for various elemental abundances. So this is the um, helium abundance, this is the deuteron abundance, for example, depending on the baryon to photon ratio in the early universe. And now, well, this basically gives you a prediction, right? We also know this baryon to photon ratio from the CMB. So now we can check, okay, do these predictions agree? So if you predict in pink the helium abundance and the deuteron abundance um, from the CMB and compare that to observations, observations are in yellow, then this matches really amazingly well. From which I take that we have quite some understanding of what was going on in the early universe. And it points to there being dark matter and this dark matter needs to have been there in the early universe already before Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which happened when, when the universe was at a temperature of a few MeV. Yeah, uh, so the remaining question is then, okay, well, what is this dark matter? Except for the explanation for all of the phenomena that I just explained. So a more precise question would be, what is this dark matter made of? And this is what the, what the whole talk and the whole field is about, right? Identifying dark matter. Yeah, there's two ways to go about this. Two ways you can start. Either you say, okay, let's uh, study the observed dark matter and understand better what is going on, right? Then you get uh, things like, does it self-interact? Uh, can it dissipate energy? These kinds of things. So then you would need to study the actual dark matter out there. Lots of people are doing that. It's very important, but so far, we have mostly limits, right? It cannot be too fast. It cannot interact too much. There is nothing where we have like a plus minus. It needs to have this self-interaction cross-section plus minus something. We are not there yet. Hopefully we'll get there, which will make the whole question of identifying dark matter much simpler. And then we have the, the, the other way that you can go at the problem, which we're going to do here, which is, well, maybe we have all of this evidence and, and, and kiloparsecs here, so it's a, a thousand light years. Uh, of length scales. Maybe we can probe this at 10 meters in the lab. This necessarily needs theory, right? You need to extrapolate <laughs> from very large scales to these smaller scales. So you need to, you need to basically come up with a theory which makes predictions at smaller scales, which you can then probe. And then you look for them in the lab. 
And this is then also where, where theorists or phenomenologists like me and you guys are needed um, to, to make sound extrapolations from these very large scales to predictions on, on scales that we can test in labs or in our own galaxy. Yeah, and uh, well, my favorite thing to think of is uh, particles. Dark matter might be particles. Uh, that could be, right? So what if dark matter are particles? First, it cannot be the particles we know. Uh, it can be neutrinos, they would be too fast. It cannot be stuff made of baryons because, well, from BBN, we know the budget of baryons that we have to work with, and dark matter was already there at BBN. Um, it could be maybe black holes or some exotic matter that formed from stuff that we know. That's interesting, but that also, of course, requires um, then some, some new physics, some beyond the standard model particle physics. So that's why it's, uh, I think, very justified to, to treat the dark matter problem also in a big part as a, as a problem for a particle physicist. Which still just leaves us at the question, okay, well, where, where do we start then um, looking at it as a particle physicist? And one option is to look at the most precisely measured quantity as an inspiration and try to take it from there. So that's what we're going to do. Um, we look at, okay, what do we know best about dark matter? It's density. It's cosmological average density. And we try to make the most of this information to get information, uh, to get predictions that we can test in the lab. Yeah, so, so the name of the game here is, is production mechanisms. We want dark matter production mechanisms that relate this known quantity to properties we can observe in the lab. And this obviously needs some more assumptions, right? Um, mostly about, uh, about early universe cosmology. So, and here we're going to take the minimal assumptions that you can, you can take. We just take, okay, the, the measured lambda CDM cosmology that we infer from the CMB and extrapolate that to higher temperatures. Now, the nice thing about thermal relics, which I'll explain in a minute, is that we only need to extrapolate so much. We only need to extrapolate to about when the temperature of the sand model bath was the mass of the dark matter. We don't need to extrapolate to the Planck scale or to inflation or anything like that. It's, it's sufficient to, to say, okay, maybe until the scale we know what happened in the early universe. Yeah, and then basically the, the uh, standard cosmology just gives us the backdrop upon which we can calculate dark matter production. So that this backdrop being the expansion rate of the universe and the temperature evolution, so the expansion rate being dominated by the radiation density in the standard model bath, which is related to the temperature of the standard model bath. This is a very minimal assumptions regarding cosmology from which we're trying to then make some particle physics prediction from the dark matter relic abundance. Yeah, there's this nice fact that equilibration uh, erases any history that was before this, um, but we'll get into that now. Yeah. Good. So this is the WIMP slide. You have all heard of WIMP, so I'm sorry if this is a repetition. Um, for me, a WIMP is a thermal relic that was once in thermal equilibrium with a thermal. Or a thermal relic was, is, is a particle, is a dark matter particle that was once in thermal equilibrium with a bath. What do I mean by that? Well, so if you calculate the evolution of the dark matter density, number density here in the early universe, you do that with this Boltzmann equation, for example. Um, so that the, the evolution of the dark matter number density gets a contribution, just a diluting contribution from the expansion of the universe. And then there's lots of stuff that can happen to it from interactions with the standard model bath. Um, in particular, for WIMPs, these annihilation reactions where, where dark matter particles annihilate into the standard model or backwards standard model particles annihilate and create dark matter particles. And this happens with a, with a velocity average cross-section for this process here. And if this process happens frequently, then the dark matter abundance is pushed to its equilibrium value. Whereas Right, so that's just, if, if this term here is the largest in this whole equation, then, then these two here, this difference is forced to be zero. Um, whereas if this term here gets smaller and smaller, then suddenly this dilution term will dominate. And you can uh, pick, well, and, and what this results in is, um, this is like a, the 
co-moving dark matter number, or this is the dark matter density normalized to, uh, to for example, at that time, photons. Um, and here, this is a, a time variable written in terms of temperature. So time goes in this direction to the right. So that in the early universe, when interactions are frequent, then the dark matter density equilibrates, right? It tracks its equilibrium value. This is also what I mean by erasing cosmological history, right? Suppose you have some initial condition where there's no dark matter, right? There's, okay, we start here at this temperature and there's no dark matter. Then this interaction will quickly pull the dark matter to its equilibrium value. Um, and from then on, all of the calculations are valid, yeah. Until at some point you have freeze out. That's the thermal relic, the WIMP thermal relic, when, when these interactions become insufficiently strong to still keep this to its equilibrium value, and then you freeze out. And here the dynamics are that if you make this cross-section larger, if you have stronger annihilation, then the, relic, the, the dark matter density can track the equilibrium value for a longer time because the cross-sections are larger and you get a lower dark matter density in the end. This is a very general framework, right? You can, you can plug in whatever you want here and you still get this rough kind of result. Um, it predicts that the dark matter density is inversely proportional to this, uh, this velocity, uh, sorry, thermally averaged cross-section at freeze out. And it makes a very useful prediction because if you demand that this should reproduce the observed value for the density, then you find that this annihilation cross-section should have this value. That's about a picobarn times the speed of light. That's super nice. It's a great model. It's one of the most successful models in dark matter. It's not yet clear whether it actually describes nature, but it's been extremely successful at provoking people to test it. Um, because there's this nice relation that you only need this one particle physics process and, and turning it around, you, you get lots of useful predictions. So for example, uh, in dark matter indirect detection, you try to find this process going on in galaxies today. And for example, producing antiprotons or gamma rays, which you then observe um, at, at cosmic ray detectors. But you can read the same diagram the other way around, right? And try to produce dark matter in colliders. So here, this is a yeah, event, <laughs> well, simulation of what it would look like if you had lots of dark matter not seen, a big, well, a heavy dark matter particle escaping here unseen, recoiling against this massive jet. And finally, you can, you can turn like this, right? So the dark matter scatters off your detector that you place in a lab somewhere and you can try to find that. And that's been particularly successful at uh, testing, testing with dark matter models. Yeah, so if you've been familiar with the WIMP story for some time, then there's, um, people are talking about the demise of the WIMP or whether WIMPs are still viable or interesting to look at. And there's two perspectives here. First, they are still viable and extremely interesting for, to look at for experiments. So the thing is, this is, uh, what this plot shows is, um, experimental sensitivities to, to scattering of dark matter of nuclei. And the current experiments, the, well, let's see, and we're down to xenon anton almost. Well, let, let's say this blue dashed line is the current experiment. Um, and future experiments, which are already running, will improve this bound by an order of magnitude like late this year. Uh, so that's amazing. All of this parameter space here is untested and will be tested in the next two or three years. So there's great potential for something interesting to be discovered here. What you can also see in this plot though, is that there's a natural limit to how far you can push this when, when the neutrinos from the sun start hitting your detectors and you cannot tell that apart from dark matter anymore. Um, so actually here in this last large dark matter range, well, there's, there's a limit on to how far you can push the experiments with current technology and we're approaching the limit. And there's very different plans how to do that. So this is great. This dark matter, WIMP dark matter paradigm has really um, inspired both the, uh, well, inspired experiments to really go there and do it. Now for a theorist, maybe that's okay. It would be nice if we find it there, but for the moment, where else are we not looking? Um, as a theory, this is an experimentalist job now, right? You have to push this down and then hope that we find dark matter there. That would be great. But I'm not an experimentalist, so uh, let's look at other options, right? For example, there's this, uh, this is the same kind of plot here on the right hand side. Um, and here you have this neutrino flow, which was blue before, and current experiments here and next generation experiments here. And you see there's, there's some space here left to explore, which we will be exploring, and that's great. But there's a huge amount of space to explore here. 
um, which has get, been getting more attention, more and more attention uh, recently. So people looking at the uh, lighter dark matter, not the traditional electroweak scale WIMPs, but MEV scale WIMPs. And this is one uh, this talk will also be about, right? So, but it's very interesting to, to do theory here because there will be experimental progress eventually, and there's, there's starting to be lots of experimental progress probing this. Um, and we need to, to find for experimentalists some, some things to aim their experiments at. Well, for indirect detection, uh, the, the William story goes a bit the same. So this, for example, here is our bounds on uh, dark matter indirect detection, the annihilation cross-section from antiprotons. And this is this thermal relic annihilation uh, benchmark value. And you see that this is ruled out from antiprotons uh, up to dark matter masses of about 500 GeV if dark matter annihilates exclusively into W bosons. Um, that's great. It's a pity that we didn't really see it. Well, okay, let's not <laughs> be too fast, right? Maybe we're seeing something, but who knows? Um, yeah, there's experiments being built to, to try to push this to larger masses, right? To push, uh, probe larger mass winds, for example, uh, most prominently uh, CTA. Uh, the Triangle Telescope Array looking at gamma rays, which may find WIMPs up to tens of TV, which is amazing. And that's being built, so that's great. So uh, as a theorist, I, I, do, I, can, I can basically wait for, the, wait for the data and see what comes in. Or I can try to push somewhere else, right? So what this plot shows is a, is a projected sensitivity increase for an MEV gamma ray telescope, right? So here again, we are in the MEV range. Um, and the blue one is a current bound from the CMB on dark matter annihilation. And the red one shows what an MEV gamma ray telescope may be able to achieve with existing technology if sent into space. Uh, and there's, well, up to, what is this, uh, three or four orders of magnitude to discover here. So if dark matter lives here, that would be extremely interesting. And there's not so many models yet at the uh, low mass WIMPs. Uh, so it's a very interesting thing to build models for. And finally, at colliders, I mean, you know the story, the LHC is running, it will collect another factor of 10 of uh, integrated luminosity. And that's 10 times more events than we had now. So there might be something very interesting there. Now I want to point your attention briefly to this Bell 2, which now just has, has, has reached luminosity parity with some pre-existing experiments. So it's an electron positron collider at lower energy, well, at a few GeVs of energy. Um, but this will, uh, within the next few years, collect a factor of, uh, I think, uh, of a thousand, yeah, of, of almost a thousand more in integrated luminosity than it has now. So uh, very interesting things might show up. For example, here, dark matter coupled to muons, uh, <laughs> which uh, I will also show some. So in summary, the status of WIMPs is that there's good chances to find something soon. Experiments are running and probing interesting parameter space, and we might hear of something interesting tomorrow. There's also plenty of motivation to consider not so traditional lighter sub-GV dark matter, because there's lots of experiments that are either are probing or may probe that in the near future. So we should really get a grip on what we can expect to see there. And this is what the rest of this talk will be about, about a sub gv thermal relic dark matter. Now this may, from the, okay, maybe I should ask uh, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to interrupt me. Now, if you, did, uh, sorry, uh, I was thinking about the, the neutrino floor and recently I have read about the, the, the xenon and ton experiment and they have said that it may be we can't find dark matter like WIMPs in these experiments anymore because of the degeneracy with neutrino floor. So, what you are trying to do exactly in these terms, I think is trying to look for a dark matter, which is lightest because of that, right? Yeah, so my understanding is that there's um, this xenon anton here, that's this uh, very hard to see dashed line, that's running now. 
and they're taking data, they are already analyzing the first slices of data. Um, so they might maybe see one or two neutrino events. Yeah. Um, which is not yet badly degenerate with dark matter, right? You, you can still probe dark matter. If, you, if your background is just a few neutrinos events, then you're still good. You can, if you then see 10 events, then maybe you know that there's something yeah, funny is. going on. Um, but if you want to push beyond, then you start to, to lose return on investment. So what people are now doing, they, they're not calling this neutrino floor anymore because it's not like you hit rock bottom and then that's it, but it's more of a neutrino fog. So what this graphic from, from this SNOMAS uh, report uh, tries to, to sell is that as you try probing do further down here, you need a larger increase in mass times time, so in exposure. You need a larger it. increase in exposure to get the same I got figure of merit. So it becomes harder and harder to probe down here. It's not impossible, but it, it becomes harder and harder. Yeah, I got it. Thing. Yeah, yeah, and my point is that um, here you're still very far from it. There, there's different problems here, right? There's background problems here, it's, uh, and and there's very little energy deposited if you have such light dark matter scattering of your detector. Um, but some of these technological challenges are being overcome, so that that this becomes interesting very much from this point of view. That there's just so much open parameter space here. It's, it's very worthwhile to push here, but afterwards or at the same time there is so much to see maybe here yeah yeah okay. I, uh, so uh, so that's why you were searching for sub gv dark matter right that last plot you showed actually all of these for me are motivation to look for it where to, to uh, these all of these are places where you could find it. If it's there, then these are places where it could show up. It could show up at an electron positron collider, it could show up in MeV gamma rays, and it could show up in, in direct detection. And all of these experiments are now being built, so there's chances to see it. And all of these are WIMPs also, right? Yeah, so so back in the days, WIMPs used really to refer to weakly interacting massive particle, and people thought about electroweak scale interacting massive particle, right? Maybe even SU2 charged dark matter. Um, but nowadays, uh, for me, my WIMP definition is that it's a thermal relic where the relic abundance is set by freeze out of annihilation reactions. And then you get a WIMP. Oh, OK. And now the question is, OK, what's the lightest WIMP you can get? And then maybe maybe I start talking about again. So back in the days, people thought about, OK, electroweak scale WIMPs or SU2 charged. SU2L, sun model charge WIMPs, and asked, okay, what's the lightest WIMP you can have? And there's this Lee Weinberg bound, um, which says that, okay, dark matter needs to be at least as, two, as massive as 2 GeV. Otherwise, uh, you would get too much dark matter um, because, the, well, because the annihilation wouldn't be strong enough for, for the lighter, lighter thing. Um, so there would be this bound that you naively think, okay, back from this paper, that okay, WIMPs must be GV heavy. But this really only holds true for electroweakly charged, like G Fermi V minus A type interaction WIMPs. Um, and if you if you take my definition of a WIMP, which is a thermal relic with uh, so so particle with freeze out abundance, where the uh, sorry where annihilation <laughs> set the relic abundance, then Actually, the, the, this bound relaxes by three orders of magnitude. So that the, the next thing that you really get from observation is that uh, constraints on exotic energy in, injection. So that this annihilation process that needs to deplete the dark matter bonds in the early universe injects lots of energy into the sand model bath. And this, if it happens too late, messes with observables. So if, for example, well, if this dark matter annihilates mostly into neutrinos, then you would have too many neutrinos in the early universe. Uh, sorry, in the universe now, if it happened too late. And happening too late always means lighter dark matter, right? Lighter dark matter annihilates later in time. So then you then produce lots of neutrinos um, at, at times that you can ob already observe or where these neutrinos otherwise had already decoupled. Um, 
And if you go into standard, into charged particles, for example, you annihilate into electrons and positrons, then it's even worse, right? So your effective number of neutrinos goes down, but these these um, fast electrons and positrons they might even they might destroy the deutrons that you produce in BBN nucleosynthesis and so on. So there's bounds on that. And when you put Big Bang nuclear synthesis and the CMB together and ask, okay, what's what's the lightest wimp that you are allowed to have without messing these up? You find something like a six to 10 MV. So this is now the lower bound that we're worried about. And I'm now interested in anything above this bound up to, well, a few dV. And the question of how can we populate, how, is that possible? How can you have dark matter in this math range between these 2 dV and the 6 MeV? What kind of dark matter models would you need? And what do they tell you about how to test that? And the first issue is that we need a new light mediator particle. Um, so there was this, this uh, wind miracle that you get the correct relic abundance when you plug in electroweak scale cross sections. That's the wind miracle, right? You expect new physics at the electroweak scale. Um, and this magically conspires to have correct masses and couplings to give you the observed dark matter relic abundance. This is still true today. I mean, this uh, wind miracle is there, and I really hope for electroweak scale winds. That would be great, and we might find them very soon. But this is not a very restrictive argument, right? You can have other types of interactions. For example, say you have some dark matter particle of mass m chi that interacts by a mediator with mass capital M and coupling G then the cross sections you get would have this kind of form. And if you plug in these numbers here, if you want to reproduce the correct relic abundance, for example, for a 100 MeV dark matter candidate, then you find that, okay, if you want to have an electric weak scale mediator, it would need to have a coupling of order one, which is hard to reconcile with data that we have from the LHC now, right? If you say, okay, if there's a, you have some particle, some mediator particle that couples to the light standard model degrees of freedom with strengths of order one, then arguably we would have found that already. Another option is to have a lighter mediator with a much smaller coupling. And arguably, well, as I was sure, <laughs> there's options for these to not yet have found these, but where these light mediators still are able to produce the correct relic abundance. So this is issue one, if you want to have light, light wimps, you need a new mediator. Okay, now we have some, 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 some starting points for how to build models. Uh, there's a second issue, which is data, and that's kind of, <laughs> there's no way to, okay. <laughs> you need to take care about data. So what this plot here shows you is constraints, again, on this annihilation cross-section, depending on the dark matter mass. And this dashed line here is the prediction for the correct relic abundance very naively. Um, and what you see is that you will have trouble if dark matter is lighter than about 10 GV, independent of what your annihilation channel is. Okay, if you go all into neutrinos, then maybe you're good. But if you go into anything charged, then you get into trouble with the CMB. That's because this energy injection rate of the annihilation really, it, it scales with the square of the dark matter number density. So in the end, your constraints get stronger at lower masses. So that for, to, to have a WIMP with mass less than 10 GeV, you somehow require that the velocity averaged annihilation cross-section today or during CMB decoupling was much smaller than it frees out, right? So that, you live, that your model lives somewhere quite below the black dashed line. This is issue number two and there's solutions to that, which might tell us something about what are nice and interesting uh, dark matter models. Good, so uh, yeah. Uh, now we can get right into it. How to have sub GV dark matter? Uh, sorry, sub GV thermal relic dark matter. What do we need? We need a dark matter candidate, some neutral particle that's stable. And the, the simplest way to to impose stability is to just have some some Z two dark parity, so that dark matter by some symmetry is not allowed to decay into some more particles. It can only annihilate in pairs. And we need a new light mediator. This needs to be able to couple to the dark matter as well as to the light standard model particles, right? Because we, we live at a few MeV, so we need to actually talk to the standard model bath at that temperature. So you need to couple to the light standard model particles, mostly fermions and, uh, and photons maybe. 
Good, and there's a few options which are popularly discussed in the literature. Maybe the most popular one is the dark photon. So you, you have something like electromagnetism and a dark matter that's charged under that. And then there's um, that can talk to the standard model uh, photon through kinetic mixing. Now this is a very, it's a, what is it? It's a gauge extension, but otherwise a simple model. It could be, sure. Um, it kind of has trouble with uh, making the couplings large enough that you can have freeze out. This is very popular for freezing, if you've heard of that. Um, but for, for really making WIMP dark matter, that's actually kind of, kind of hard because these dark photons also talk to electrons and there's lots of constraints from there. Yeah, and there's lots of other thermal extensions where you can have light mediators, right? You can have L nu minus L tau, Z primes. Uh, you can just have a light scalar signal that you couple to the Higgs. Here, again, you have problem, right? How, how is this going to talk to the light standard model degrees of freedom? Only through the Higgs. And the Higgs has tiny couplings to the light standard model degrees of freedom. So this, again, has trouble there. And what many phenomenologists just do as well, they just write down a coupling, right? That's how hard can it be? And just, uh, you need to, of course, take care of the chiral structure of the standard model. But once you do that, once you allow for, for some UV physics, once you care about UV incomplete models, then, then you can die and write down lots of things. But here the idea is to write down a UV complete model. Um, so uh, I'll present now for the rest of the talk here, uh, how you can have a light mediator in a second Higgs doublet. Yeah, so that leads us to the, to the two Higgs doublet model which is a very simple extension of the standard model of particle physics. You just say, okay, the, you have the standard model Higgs that gets a VEV, and then you have this uh, neutral scalar here, and then some things, some Goldstone bosons that are absorbed by the gauge bosons. And we add to that a second Higgs. And we can write it in a basis that the second Higgs doublet does not get a VEV. There's a scalar potential associated to that, of course. Uh, you have some, some mass terms here, quadratic terms, and then you have a bunch of quartic terms. The point being, there is many different terms here. Of course, you need to ensure then potential stability. You need to have a, you, you need to reproduce the correct electroweak vacuum. So there's constraints on these guys, but there's also a lot of freedom in the many parameters that you have. Here. Um, we will work uh, in the alignment limit, where we've seen at the NHC that there is a scalar boson at 125 GeV, which behaves very much like we expect from the standard model. So much so that we are just here just going to assume that it's completely aligned. Then this Higgs here also is the mass eigenstate that we observe at the LHC. And then we have a few, then we have these three new uh, massive scalars, um, which is the CP even massive scalar, a CP odd massive scalar, and a charged scalar from the second Higgs tablet. And the crucial point here is that, that okay, the, the relation of the Higgs mass to the standard model electroweak valve and the lambda quartic coupling, you know that's just the standard model relation. But the masses of these other guys depend on different combinations of these couplings. In particular, this combination of couplings here may be small. This guy here could be just one GeV heavy or 100 MeV or whatever you like. You just need to have the correct couplings here. Whereas these other guys here depend on different combinations of couplings. So their masses may be split. They could be much more massive than this guy. So for the purposes of this talk, we are going to choose this guy here being very light and the other guy is pretty heavy and similar for some place. Yeah, and all of this works nicely. They, well, still from these relations, you find that they actually, they need to be kind of around the corner. So this makes very nice predictions also for the LHC. The takeaway message from this slide being that you can have a sub GV scalar H in the Twix lab model, which has not gotten so much attention in the dark matter community. Good. So there's a few things you my objections you might raise. No, you shouldn't do that. For example, you shouldn't split members of the same electric multiplier too much. If you do, you get into trouble with electric precision tests. Um, with electric oblique, with the oblique parameters. Um, for example, this uh, T parameter depends on the masses of these scalars or on the mass splittings. Um, but actually it turns out, I mean, there's a uh, there's few contributions and 
as long as these guys here are not heavier than 250 GV, then this is actually fine. Uh, in fact, there's been indications for, uh, you probably have heard that there, there's been a measurement of the W mass, which is significantly larger than the Stanmore prediction and other experimental results. Um, and if true, then this would prefer actually these electric oblique parameters, particularly the T parameter to be non-zero, which could be a first indication for this kind of scenario where you have a split doublet. Next, you need to make sure that these scalars are still allowed and you wouldn't have seen them, them at lab already. For example, the Z can decay into the CP odd and CP even scalar if kinematically allowed. So this obviously is not the case. Otherwise, we would have seen that. So this guy needs to be pretty heavy. Then the charge scalars you also could have produced at lab if they were, weren't too massive. So obviously, if they exist, they must be more massive than this 110 GV. And the LEC constraints, they can, they can be evaded for substantial branching ratios into towers or just dark decays. Uh, yeah, and you predict additional signature processes that, that you might observe if, if these light scalars are, exist. Uh, so this is very exciting also from a collider perspective. Then we know that the Higgs is pretty standard-like, so we already are in the alignment limit so that all of the couplings to the gauge bosons and coupling to the uh, thermal fermions work out. But there's some new Higgs decays which are induced by these other particles. So obviously the Higgs can, could decay into the lighter new Higgs, um, which would then decay on into whatever it couples to or dark matter, so invisible. And this puts a constraint on this combined coupling here, which puts this lambda three parameter actually very predictively uh, related to the mass of the charge scalars. And in turn, the charge scalars uh, contribute to the decay of the Higgs to two gammas, right? You can have the Higgs coupling to the charge scalar, doing a loop and radiating two gammas, um, which depends on this lambda three. So this, uh, in the end, predicts this signal strength of Higgs going to gamma gamma to be a bit smaller than one, while large hadron collider does prefer it to be a bit larger than one. But at the moment, this is uh, still OK. It could work out. Uh, yeah. So now we've talked about this general, what happens, how to have light Higgs in the Twig Stanmore model, right? Um, in the end, we want it to be a mediator, so it needs to couple to the standard model, light degrees of freedom. And it can do that through a Yukawa coupling, right? So just like the normal Higgs, the new Higgs will have Yukawa coupling to the standard model fermions, which is, a, we are completely free to choose actually, <laughs> except for uh, experimental constraints um, in this alignment limit. So we have the coupling to standard model light degrees of freedom already, which gives us lots of constraints again. So uh, yeah, the first thing being, if you have a new scalar that couples, for example, to the muon, then this will contribute to the muon anomalous magnetic moment and might actually address this long-standing tension there. Uh, so that's nice. Um, you can, this also means that you can produce the light scalar from its coupling to, to light standard model degrees of freedom. Oh, I should say, sorry, I forgot, that for simplicity, um, for this first paper, we, we, we're working on, a, on an extension, but for simplicity, we first focus on the coupling to leptons only, not to quarks. Quarks is totally also fine, but it's just uh, from, from muon G minus two and neutrino masses and so on, it's interesting to consider leptons and a bit simpler because there's no colors. Uh, yeah, so, okay, but uh, continuing with the text, uh, if your new light scalar couples to leptons, you can produce it in all kinds of settings, right? You can produce it in supernova cores, which leads to supernova cooling, which gives you a bound like this here. It rules out all of this big parameter space. Um, you can obviously produce it in beam dump experiments, right? You hit lots of um, whatever protons or electrons into, in, into your beam dump. And then if you produce uh, muons there, or you just have radiative couplings, then you can produce the scalars, the scalars, don't interact so much, they can pass through the rock and then decay and the decay products can hit a detector, which then also constrains these light scales. You can produce them directly in collider experiments, this like this spell two that I was talking about. Uh, yeah, and also you can modify, of course, standard model particle decays. Right? If, if, if the Z decays into two towers and one of these Ks radiates also one of these new Higgs, then this is an additional Z decay channel which will modify the branching ratios on which there are constraints and so on. Yeah, th this is it basically from the particle physics side, right? From the standard model probes side. 
of this mediator, but we wanted to have dark matter, right? So let's let's get into it and couple some dark matter to this light Higgs. And the simplest dark matter that you can come up, come up with is just a real scalar, one degree of freedom, stabilized with a, with this uh, discrete parity symmetry. Um, yeah, and this has all kinds of couplings to itself, and uh, also importantly couplings to the new mediator, right, which sits right here. Um, so if you now take that together, the coupling of the new scalar to the mediator and of the mediator to the light thermal degrees of freedom, then you have your light thermal, uh, light thermal dark matter model set up, where these light scalars can annihilate by an S-channel light mediator into a certain model absence, for example. Looking good. Now we have the light mediator, right? That was issue number one. Let's remember issue number two. Uh, to have sub GV thermal dark matter was that you somehow need to avoid this annihilation here or suppress it at late times. And this works, for example, simply if you forbid it kinematically. If you say that, sorry, these guys here in the final state are a bit heavier than those here. So that when these are slow or at late times, this cannot happen because it's kinematically impossible. And the idea here was uh, in this forbidden dark matter. Um, which is exactly that, that you introduce some mass splitting. The dark matter is slightly lighter than what it annihilates to. So that this interaction is Boltzmann suppressed compared to the opposite interaction. Um, so the annihilation reaction is actually Boltzmann suppressed here by this uh, temperature, sorry, temperature factor. So that if, uh, when the temperature goes to zero at late time, so during CMB decoupling or today inside the center of the galaxy, then this is very suppressed. So that fixes the whole issue. That's very nice. Um, so we are now finally ready to, to calculate the relic abundance in this scenario. Um, and that's it. Here, here you go. This is uh, the spot shows here for, for the case where the new scalar couples predominantly to muons. So the dark matter will predominantly annihilate into muons. Um, uh, this shows here the, the new light Higgs mass. And here the coupling to the muons. And this line reproduces the correct relic abundance if the mass splitting is very small. Um, there's a few features here to look out for. So we had this S channel resonance, right? Here, when these guys here are just on the S channel, S channel just produce an on shell mediator, that's exactly here. Because this is the case where the dark matter has the same mass as the muons, a bit smaller than the muons. Um, so this is like two times the moon mass here. So here you have the resonance. And then towards very small masses, actually what happens is that the dark matter just doesn't annihilate to muons anymore, but predominantly annihilates into mediators, right? Two of the scalars just go into two of the mediator particles. And this can also produce the correct relic balance. Now you can make the mass, yeah. Johan, yes, I have a question. Uh, would that work for, um... Uh, center of galaxies, you know, do you have a uh, uh, large number of, of dark matter particles that they will annihilate, you know, to, it will be kinematically allowed to annihilate, but they will not be allowed to annihilate at, uh, you know, at the, at the edges of, of the galaxies, you know, that, that would, uh, you know, in order to solve the core cause problem. Okay, so, so you're saying that could you have it that at the center of the galaxies, the dark matter is a bit faster so that there it can annihilate, whereas in the outskirts, it's yes. slower, so it cannot. Yes, exactly. Um, there will be a mechanism to... Yeah, so um, where, where you would tune or, this mass splitting, so to say, so that just in the center of galaxies, it can annihilate. Um, yeah, my impression, uh, from what I remember from this core problem is that you cannot solve it by annihilating significant amounts of dark matter just because the energy flux would be very large, right? Because you, if you want to get rid of all of the dark matter, that it would be excessive in, in the cusp. If you want to get rid of the cusp by annihilation, then that implies huge energy injections. All right. But that, that would be my first hunch. That this is, um, it's an interesting idea though. Oh. Yeah, I, there, there must be people who, who looked into into annihilations with thresholds like that. And uh, yeah. yeah, but I, I, I can't point you anywhere. So oh, that's fine. Thank you.
Okay, so now here, if you have very large mass splittings, then this is, it doesn't work at all, right? In the centers of galaxies, you also only have, uh, well, you have one, 10 to the minus three, velocities of 10 to the minus three, which is still very non-relativistic, right? So there's, there's not a lot of energy you have to get above the kinematic threshold. Um, so yeah, here, for example, now, if you, if you have a larger mass splitting of about 10% of the, of the final state mass, then you need larger couplings, right? We have that if you make a, have a mass splitting, then you get Boltzmann suppression. So you need larger couplings to counteract that. That's also what you see here. Yeah, um, so these are predictions and you can always contrast predictions with um, constraints. Um, so here I've shown this uh, added constraints from the supernova, from a beam dump experiment here, and this is from muon G minus two. So the magnetic of the moment of the muon deviates far too much from its thermal value here, whereas in the green band here, it can actually reproduce uh, the observations. This uh, anomalous magnetic moment observed by Fermilab now. So that's nice. I mean, uh, you, you see the, this stuff, there's a viable parameter space here and it can address them anomalies. You can also have uh, couplings to, to uh, well, you, uh, different Yukawa coupling textures where you couple, for example, to the mu on the tau. And if you do that, then to have forbidden dark matter, you need to have a mass of about the tau, right? So, so you live at larger masses here. Uh, the resonance was where two times the dark matter mass was about, well, two times the muon mass here, two times the dark matter mass is about two times the tau mass. Um, and this still works out. You have some different constraints from, from exotic standard model particle decay so that the tau shouldn't decay into dark matter too much. There's constraints on that, for example. Um, but otherwise, it's a very similar picture, no? Um, sorry, and uh, you can also annihilate into taus. Uh, that also works out nicely. And it's still below 10 GV, so that's good, great. Now, how do we go about testing this? There, we already talked about a lot of tests that you can do based on particle physics, right? On colliders where it might show up. Um, but there's some more specific uh, dark matter specific tests. Um, so actually one thing we found out is that in this forbidden dark matter scenario, right? We, we wanted to circumvent problem number two by just making the final state kinematically forbidden. That works, it's nice. You can forbid it, but even if you forbid it, you will have radiative annihilation into photons, which is not kinematically forbidden, right? Photons have zero mass. Um, this is suppressed by a loop factor, but it's actually enhanced when you compare it to this naive thermal relic cross-section expectation by the fact that you have this Boltzmann suppression to begin with, right? We need, we need larger couplings in the Boltzmann suppressed case so that this one guy here will be enhanced. So that actually radiative annihilation is a very uh, sensitive probe of uh, this forbidden dark matter scenario. So here, yeah, here I've, I've colored the, the non-forbidden regime, right? This is where the mass splitting is zero. Um, and below this, you could only access if your mass splitting were, well, <laughs> if there were no Boltzmann suppression at all. So this is forbidden by direct annihilation. Here, direct annihilation is not kinematically forbidden. But actually, there's this uh, annihilation into gamma rays uh, at the one loop level. And this gives you already from the same B some pretty good constraints here. So that what remains now really is the sliver here in the middle. Um, and yeah, we're probing actually here some of the stuff uh, that, that could otherwise explain the muon G minus two. But it still works out, everything's good. So this was uh, nice to realize, right? That we found that this radiative process you should take into account, it's important. The scenario still works, that's also good. But this actually would be a kind of a smoking gun signal for the whole, whole affair, right? Um, so to find, to really find dark matter, to identify dark matter, it's not just sufficient to find some missing energy events in your collider, right? You don't know what you produce there, whether it has any relation to, to cosmology and to galaxies. Um, so for dark matter identification, what you want in the end is to, to look at places where there is dark matter and see, do you see it there? Do you see these annihilations here going on in the centers of galaxies? And at the moment, the situation of telescopes looking at MEV dark matter is not so good. 
because the most uh, the, the the most recent instruments have pushed to higher sensitivities and higher energies so the the best thing at gev energies is fermi that and cta is being built at higher energies and higher sensitivities so that's good but there's this big gap here and there's nothing really really planned or funded to close it between the very sensitive x-ray experiments and the gv tv uh, gamma ray story but there are proposals to close to fill this gap which would improve sensitivities by orders of magnitude which would be extremely interesting here right that's the smoking gun signal that we would expect is that here you have these mono energetic gamma rays from the galactic center or from dwarf galaxies or from wherever dark matter is um, and there's ways to improve sensitivity here maybe we've been missing dark matter sitting here all this time just because we said okay let's build telescopes here rather than here and now there's there's actually the 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 number of proposals has been exploding so there's there's interest is gathering in, at the mev scale and would be very very nice for these film searches yeah i already showed this part that this is the sensitivity projection for uh, actually for for i think yesterday um uh in in, in terms of this annihilation cross-section in red into two photons which is exactly what i am interested in here and you see that there's huge potential for improvement which would really put us a lot for maybe dark matter is sitting right here you should build it we find it yeah so this is the projection on on, on our model plot is done if you build this this instrument here then uh, you would find dark matter in all of the space here if if dark matter is anything like this model and it's true in any of this parameter space then you find it with us if it couples to muons at least um and there's only this tiny sliver here left that would be very nice. This would be the smoking gun signal. Um, it's also very distinctive. It's super good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So that's uh, that. That concludes my talk. Also. So um, to summarize, uh, I hope I uh, convinced you that there there's dark matter, um, and that thermal radic particles are a really nice candidate for it, and that it's really nice for theorists to look into low mass wimp dark matter because there's so, just so much potential there in the coming years and the concrete model that i propose here is this uh, that in a twig seven model you can have a light scalar which can mediate between the standard model and the dark matter um and the simplest uh dark matter scenario here is this forbidden dark matter scenario where these radiative annihilations would be a smoking gun signature that would be very exciting to look for yeah uh, thanks a lot if you have further questions i'm very happy Oh, thank you very much, Johannes. Uh, again, any more pregunta? Any questions? Um, well, uh, I have this uh, naive question uh, that from one of your or your first slides, maybe the second one, I guess. Um, or no, it's a little more when you show the Boltzmann equation. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. So the history is uh, we don't know the history of that the number of particle, right? Because it went it was in equilibrium, and from before from inflation, uh, we don't know right what happened to it. Uh, even if even if that. Uh, interaction was very, very small, like negligible. No, I mean, in the cross section times uh, velocity average, if it were like very, very negligible, um, maybe it would just expand, you know, with the universe. And if, if it never uh, was an equilibrium, you know? yeah. Yeah, so here the question kind of is, um, okay, what's the initial condition for, for this scenario, right? I just present you a differential equation to have a different solution. You need an initial condition. And for example, inflation might, a particular model of inflation might give you an initial condition. All right. And the nice thing about this thermal relic dark matter is that the end result doesn't depend on the initial condition. Because if this cross section is large enough that you enter equilibrium, then it doesn't matter what, what dark matter did before. Yeah. So if, if dark matter started out at very early times with a very small abundance, um, but then equilibrated because this interaction was strong enough for equilibration, then you still get this result here. And the result depends only on the annihilation cross-section, not on inflation. All right. 
I this think is why that's because uh, at this point you are assuming that your dark matter is uh, is in thermal equilibrium with the the bath. So the and the initial condition that you put on your uh, come off in abundance the both my question is that the initial abundance is exactly as the equilibrium. No, I don't but, need that. So if this, I don't need to assume the initial abundance. As long as I ensure that this cross section is large enough, yeah. I don't care about the initial abundance. Yes. Right? So yeah. this is what I meant by, by, by minimal assumptions on cosmology. Really, we're just extrapolating standard cosmology to temperatures of the mass of the dark matter. We don't need to make any assumptions of what happens at higher temperatures with inflation and whatever. Yes. All right. Yeah, this is a great advantage over, I mean, there's very nice, it could also, uh, I, you maybe you've heard, there's dark matter production mechanism that's called freezing, that if this interaction is very small and you start out at zero, then again, this is a predictive statement, right? That this interaction determines how much dark matter you get. Yeah, but, but the case of freezing. The condition. Yeah, I was thinking of more like going but backwards, you, you know, from today's uh, density. No, without the right part of the equation, you don't have yeah. the nonlinear. No, you don't have the nonlinear part, uh -huh. so that it's just a linear evolution. You just go backwards, and maybe you can, you know, see something of uh, what happened here, uh, like in inflation. But no, it's just ah, yeah, but, but then then the co-moving number of dark matter particles would just stay constant. Yeah. Um, and of course, if at inflation somehow this is. But, uh, just happens to be the correct one, then that's possible. Okay. But that doesn't tell you anything about dark matter, right? I mean, then the, the, the whole idea here is to find, find some signatures that help you to identify dark matter in the end. I mean, of course, yeah. dark matter could just be there since inflation with the same co-moving yeah. number density, but that doesn't teach you anything. Or it, it, that doesn't tell you, would, that might be the case, but then we would have, there's no reason for hope to, find out what it's made of. Yeah, it would influence uh, a little bit the how uh, parameter, you know? Yeah, but it's just uh, not yeah. very much in radiation yeah, domination, much, yeah. right? Because it's yes, matter. Exactly. Yeah. It was just do what dark matter is without telling you anything else. Yeah. So in the case of your, your particle model, you are just assume that your scalar is uh, is already under Z two, right? Or it is, or you're sure that your dark matter is is stable from a gauge symmetry. I didn't got it. So here we just say that it's uh, from a Z two, right? So the Z two ensures that it only appears here with a square. Yeah. That any interaction will always have two of the dark matter particles. Okay, I see. Otherwise, with a real scalar, you could write down a, a, a like a cubic interaction, okay. right? If you didn't have the pair requirements, you could just have S, H, H, and that would lead to decay. Yeah, but this could come from a broken gauge symmetry. Yes. That could be the case. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's just that the Z2 is kind of the simplest option and like a broken gauge symmetry that might happen at high energies. Uh, yeah, you don't need I, to I, I, I see. That's it's, fine. It's... So I want, I want to just ask why they have searching for dark matter with so light masses in show like in one of your plots? Why we have not or why we have? I mean, you, you said we have done a lot of experiments for heavy, for very heavy particles. And for, but also there are many experiments for very light particles. I think it's one of your last slides. One of my last slides. Yeah. Oh, here. Yeah. Uh, no, okay. This is not searching for dark matter. This is astronomy. Ah, okay. Uh, here, people are doing x ray astronomy. Ah, this, this is for x rays. Gamma. This, this, yeah, this is just a point, a point a photon telescope at the galactic center. So okay. X-rays are very interesting to look at for astronomers. Okay. And, and high energy gamma rays are very interesting to look at for astrophysicists. 
uh-huh. and the dark matter community is just piggybacking off of these, basically. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. And then in between, you don't have, okay. And in between, so far, there just hasn't been anything. Okay. Okay, thanks. All right. Any more questions? All right. I think now. Uh, so I'd like to thank you once again, Johannes, for your uh, very nice presentation, and you know for being the first one in the semester. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot for your time and for yes, it's thanks quite a lot late. For the good yes. discussion. <laughs> thanks a lot. Thank you for the very interesting uh, to learn about dark matter and this new model. I'm sure there will be many more papers coming up for that. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs>